So thank you uh, all for, for joining us. This very important topical paper about monetary policy. Um, it's, it's great. So is Roxandra on, David? Yet yeah, she's coming on. Okay, well, why don't we just get, get started? We're really, really, it's wonderful. David is here to talk about uh, monetary policy, the policy rules and forward guidance following the COVID-19 recession. Uh, David is the Joel Saylor's professor at Houston and has a PhD at Columbia. One thing I just, looking back at the history, uh, in 2014, that's I think eight years ago, David gave a, gave a paper also with Roxandra about deviations from policy rules. The title was Deviations from Rules-Based Policy and Their Effects on the Economy. It was published in the journal of Economic Dynamics Control and Mike Bordo and I edited it, but um, I'm glad you're still working on this important topic, David, <laughs> and you have a good colleague to work with you as well. It's so important, and uh, thanks everybody for joining us. But I, that's with no further ado, David, you're going to use some slides, I believe. Okay. But well, uh, thank you. Yes, yeah, so let me. First. Well, well, if people want to ask questions, they can raise their mechanical hand. We will devote some time after your presentation to questions. But um, but go ahead, David. First, thank you very much for the um, invitation. Again, <clears throat> as John said, this paper is authored with um, Luxandra Prodan, who's a longtime co-author. Co now, the recent Hoover Monetary Policy Conference, the title of the conference had two parts, two questions. One, how monetary policy got behind the curve. And second, how to get back. The first part of this paper addresses the first question, the second part addresses the second. So in short, how did monetary policy get behind the curve? FOMC did not follow policy rules. And in particular, they didn't even follow, follow policy rules that are completely in accord with their August 2020 revised statement. What they did is followed the September 2020 forward guidance. So again, one theme from this paper is it's not the revised statement. It's not fate. It's not shortfalls. It's the forward gu gu guidance. That's, that's the issue here. Second, how to get back from where we are now. There are five more FOMC meetings in 2022. Two 50 basis point increases seem to be completely locked in. Now for June and July to get back according to the, the projections from the March SEP, you'd need four base, 50 basis point and 125 basis point rate increase to get back to the, um, the, the path. And so you could, so another theme is the, the FOMC can get to the same place at the end of 2022 that it would have gotten to if it had followed policy rule from the beginning, but you would have had a much smoother path with the policy rules in particular, one 50 basis point increase and a lot of 25 basis point in increases. So what is behind the curve? Well, that's not, that might be an obvious question, but it's not. The standard answer seems to be that feel, people feel liftoff from the effective lower bound should have been earlier. Federal funds rates should have been raised faster after liftoff, but no benchmark for what either earlier or faster means. It's based on, on people's opinion of what it should be. It's not based on a benchmark. Our answer is to define a benchmark. And we define a benchmark by policy rule prescriptions, and we'll talk about those in, in, in partic particular, but the overall theme here is the FOMC was too late and too slow, with the apologies for the too long, for, too, too, too low for too long. <laughs> so how did it get behind the curve? Well, again, I think there are two standard answers. One is inflation was higher is higher and unemployment is lower than people expected. And you see this with Jay Powell, which very recently Janet Yellen, Chris Waller at the Monetary Policy Conference. And I'll 
summarize this by basically saying we would have acted sooner had we known. Second theme is that the Fed should have expected higher inflation and they should have known. And Larry Summers at the conference, was, and, and Larry Summers has been the strongest exponent of, of this um, rule. Okay. Our answer is simply that they got behind the curve by not following the policy rule prescriptions. And in particular, it's not based on being surprised by inflation or being surprised by anything else. It's the prescriptions based on the data that the FOMC knew at the time and public had in the various summaries of economic, uh, economic um, perspective. David, could I just a, yes. a quick clarifying question? Um, is in some sense your idea that they should be reacting to observed inflation rather than to their projections of inflation, which turned out to be optimistic. Yeah, in what, y y yes, but let me, let me expand a little bit. What we do is say you act to their, th their um, to observed inflation for the time. So for the liftoff, it's inflation at the time. It's not for expe expectations uh, of, of inflation. For the path, it's their own expectations of inflation at the time. So that's why I'm saying ex post surprises don't, don't have anything to do with, with this. So lift so liftoff is the is what current inflation is at the time of the SEP. And, and and then the path is the projected path from the SEP. Okay. So it was the same thing true of every time there's a big change in. You know, you can lift off from two to four percent, and lift off a year later, four to eight percent. Or you could you could follow the pattern we had in the seventies, where at each successive point in the same part of the business cycle, the inflation rate kept rising higher. So is that same logic? They have to revisit and start over. Is that what you're saying? You can't start over. I mean, I, I mean, start over from the time of the second, the second, let's call it a shock, or the second, the second liftoff. Well, I mean, again, my from how I'm thinking about this, and maybe I'm a little confused. What you're saying, there's one liftoff from the effective lower bound. That was March of 2022. Okay. Civil prescriptions, they're okay. So it's only lift off from the effective lower bound. Th yeah, that, that's what I mean by lift. Or the off. perception that we're at the effective lower bound, even though we may not be there on long rates. Um, okay. I, I got I, 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 I missed that you said you're only talking about the lift off from the effective lower bound, which yeah. your second okay. lift off maybe you know, 10 years later, 20 years okay. later, events change. Okay, I gotcha. Yeah. I thought okay. you were talking about a big, big change from uh, where we were as a liftoff. No, I'm just saying only from the effective lower bound. I at got the it. effective lower bound, we were there. There, you had forward guidance as to when, what would have you lift off, and then what happened happened, and we have prescriptions on that. But that, that's exactly it. Okay, so we all, so, so we all know what's happened um, since. COVID-19 recession, well, first March 2020, decreased federal funds rate to the ELB and stayed there till March of 2022, raised by 25 basis points, projected seven more 25 basis point increases in 2022. That's by now ancient history that we've seen one 50 basis point in May. We expect an, another almost certainly another one in June, and then in, um, in July, and even more recently within the last week, that statements, statements and in particular Lil Brainard are consistent with not expecting a September pause. That two weeks ago, I would have said, I would have written that we probably expected a pause, maybe 25 basis point inc increase, that the likelihood seems to be, at least at the moment, of course, this can change, but a lot change, can change between now and September, not do that, have another 50 basis point increase. And those numbers are consistent with the current um, Chicago Mercantile Exchange Fed Watch tool um, no, no, numbers. Okay, so 
you have first August 2020, as we, everyone knows, revised statement, longer run goals of monetary policy strategy, flexible average inflation, targeting the moderately above 2% for some time, and the mitigate shortfalls rather than deviations from unemployment. It actually turns out to be, I believe, more important than the first part uh, of the um, statement. The forward guidance in September 2020 since to went further, maintain the target range at the effective lower bound till labor markets are consistent with assessment, Fed assessment of committed assessment of maximum employment and inflation's risen 2% and is on track to moderately exceed 2% some time. So slightly less stringent than the, the lower than the ultimate goal, but the employment side is, is, is the same. And the key word here is and. And starting in November 2021, and became important because that's when the, the FOMC statements started talking about how we've met our inflation goals, but we have not met our employment goals. So the, 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 the end really matters here. Just to note in passing, Rob Kaplan from the Dallas Fed dissented from the statement saying he preferred greater policy flexibility and made the distinction I think is crucially important between accommodative and zero. So the um, so, so when we look at, at this, we're going to look at two things. One is FOMC for guidance projections. So we're taking the summary of economic projections. We take each one quarterly from September 20 to March of, um, of, of 2022. And, and, and that look at that as the as their um, as their projections. There are the projections. The interest rates are all federal funds rated all end of year. So we interpolate, in, in, interpolate in between, make uh, you know again, some assumptions there. Um, Ellen, let, let me just finish this slide. Okay. Uh, I see. Okay, and then for the policy rule forward guidance prescriptions, we take the same SEPs, do the the um, projections for the unemployment gap and um, infl inf inflation. And so you have the current inflation unemployment and then the projections based on these SEP projections. Okay, I see Elena's hand raised. Thank you. Thank you, David. Just a clarification question. So uh, do, do, do I take your interpretation to be that the, uh, the authorities didn't appreciate the right slope of the so-called Phillips curve? despite the debate as to whether it's there, it's still there, is moving, or they simply didn't understand how stimulative the combination of their own policy and the fiscal Biden plans would have been in the face of the um, COVID crisis. My, my, Thank you. My view is that there's nothing in this paper that can, differ, that can differentiate between those interpretations or even address that question. The, what the paper, sort of the discipline in this paper is to say, let's take policy rules based on concurrent things, standard policy rules not based on, on, on forecasts and see first what, what, if the FOMC had followed that, what would they have done? Not, there's nothing here saying ex post what, what, what they should have known or didn't. No. They're counterfactually assessing the, the size of any departure from rules that they must have incurred, like a reveal preference exercise. Well, I'm, I'm not even, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I mean again, the, the, the focus here isn't so much on departures from rules, but if they had followed the rule, what path, one of, and various rules, which we'll get to, what path would they have followed? And, and then how did this, how is this different from what they did, and how did they get where they where where they 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 they, they, they were? As you know, I've written papers that have been presented here about that that second question. That's not what we're what, what we're looking. Thank you, David. At. Okay, and 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 again, there's some technical details about about these projections. I don't want to need to talk about that today. So let's look at policy rules. So. Essentially, 
all of these rules are what we call Taylor type rules, right? They would have the inflation gap following the Fed's what the Fed's doing does the monetary policy report that followed doing the unemployment and this talking through this they're doing the unemployment gap rather than the output gap but it's ex the exact same idea and that um and that basically everything here is from the SEP so for example you just start with the Taylor rule I was the federal funds rate is the neutral real interest rate or the real interest rate in the longer longer run plus inflation one half times the inflation gap plus one times the unemployment gap and the unemployment the, the 0.5 output gap becomes one with the unemployment gap with an Oaken's law with the coefficient of two on it and then fl fl flipping to get to the 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 the, the side the, the ULR and the UT to get positive numbers there and again, from the SCP, the interest rate in the longer run is 0.5, inflation's the longer run is, um, is, is two. Oh, the 0.5 comes from the nominal rate, interest rate in the long run of, of 2.5 minus the two. And then unemployment in the long run is um, four. Just to be clear, the, the, these are potentially time varying numbers which over this period of time didn't change. So these numbers are not fixed numbers. We're not, we're not saying we're fixing a long run R star or anything like that. These are just the, the numbers. And there are, there are two tiny tenth of a per, per percent point differences in here that we're just, we're just ignoring. So, it, so could I ask, a, I, I just wanna ask about this non-inertial question because it strikes me as pretty central. Uh, as I understand it, when the Fed publishes the rules, their view of it is this is kind of our long run where we should get, but they acknowledge this is, you know, we inertially head our way there. Empirical rules always have a big lagged coefficient. There's an inertial response. And that's fine. That all kind of makes sense. You know, here's where we should be getting to and we do it 25 or 50 basis points a meeting and slowly get there and so forth. But when we're evaluating, is the Fed behind the curve and how far, it would seem evaluating whether the inertial response is more or less inertial than it usually is, is, is a crucial question. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm interested that they, they leave out the inertia and, and we don't bench, often benchmark to, is the inertia more or less than what we see in the empirical rules. So you've, You've just presented my next two slides. So thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Present your next two slides, please. <laughs> so you, you just presented the, 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 the next two slides, except possibly the very end of, of it. Yes, so that was great. Um, so we're just talking about non inert starting with the non-inertial rules, but think of the non-inertial rules as where you want to be. Okay. And then we'll talk and, and inertia rules as how you as as how as how you can get there if you don't want to go so fast and that's a we get a lot of that in this paper so balanced approach rule same as the Taylor rule doubles the coefficient on the unemployment gap now in February 2021 the the um on the monetary policy report they introduced the balanced approach shortfalls rules Balanced approach shortfalls rules have the inflation side the same as the balanced approach and the Taylor rule, and but incorporates the shortfalls rather than the deviations. So on either of these rules, th that the um, unemployment gap side is either the minimum of the difference of unemployment to the long run minus unemployment or zero. So if unemployment is greater than longer run unemployment, then it puts down, it, it prescribes a, a lower federal funds rate. If unemployment is lower than unemployment long run, it it this this it it that that part becomes zero there. And that's and 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 so and 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 so you have this asymmetric aspect rather than the symmetric aspect in the in the original. Um, in, in, in the original rules, and again, we also do the Taylor shortfalls with the same the same um, co 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 coefficients. But now, as they discussed when they introduced this, now to also 
that what you have is that the shortfall rules are not go part of the way towards the revised statement, but not all the way. So we introduce what we call consistent rules. The consistent rules do two things. One is instead of saying that you're, you're approaching a 2% um, inflation target from both sides, that's a, that you're approaching an inflation target of inflation, quote, moderately above 2% for some time. We take that as 2.2 for a year, that bunch of Rich Clarida's speeches, sort of, that, that, that's where, where we, we took that. Um, that 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 um, fr from and then once you get over that, then you go back to th then you're trying to get back to the two percent target. You're not trying to get under that. In fact, Rich, Rich talked about that when, in his presentation here, like January January 2021, I I, I believe. Um, it also puts in a minimum of what we call. UME, unemployment consistent with maximum employment, that comes from the idea that 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 Fed at that point wanted to get back to February 20, 2020, unemployment at 3.5%, not unemployment at 4%. Um, bunch of, of speeches, Jay Powell saying things like 4% would be nice, but we don't we don't intend to stop there. That that so we put we put it in as, as three three point five, and then you have the balanced approach. Okay, now those are all non-inertial. Now you can take any of these rules as make and make them inertial. So you make them inertial by taking by taking coefficient rho times the lagged federal funds rate, and then one minus rho times the prescribed rate times your target rate. Standard number here is about point eight five. That's in in Bernanke, that's in Bernanke, Kylie, Kylie Roberts. That, that 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 seems to be that's be a pretty standard um, number there. And so that's that's the number we use. So so that's where we get the the inertial aspect um, of, of 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 it. And um, to get to the next slide that John presented, um, if you think about non-inertial and inertial policy rules that the um, standard st standard rules, non-inertial, are, are normative. The inertial rules tend to be positive. Policy rule forward guidance with is basically, with non-inertial rules, is nominal normative analysis with inertial rules and incorporates the FOMC practice of desire for, for 25 basis point increase for not having too high increases. This is not symmetric. They don't worry about going more than 25 on the way down. Obviously. David, could I, I, I the equations, yeah. I, I forgot to ask when I was looking at equations. Um, how are you treating the question, does the Fed react to observed inflation or to its projections of inflation? We, 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 are, we are saying observed. We are just looking at observed. Okay. Well, wait, I should be careful here. We are looking at observed inflation for its current rate setting. Okay, yeah. so then, but for the forward guidance, it's their own projections of inflation. So say in March, they make, we know what, what inflation was at that point, we use that with the, the number, the, whatever number we have there. And then say, but their projection is December. So, we so just, the forward guidance is about reacting. It's, it's, about, it's, it's, it's about their own projections, yes. Don't you feel that, that as I, read them, it seems like what, so what have they been saying? Well, we think inflation's transitory, so you don't have to do anything. So in that sense, they are reacting to inflation promptly, but they're reacting to their own projections of inflation. And so long as they don't project any inflation, they don't think they have to do anything. And what I'm going to say is that even their own projections of inflation, they should have done more than they did. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 I'm just, I'm just taking everything they do at face value. Every single thing they, 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 they do at, 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 at face value is their numbers, their projections, whatever. Because I mean, otherwise, you just go into this rabbit hole of saying, well, if they had projected this, they would have done that. We're, we're just saying everything is at face value. 
So, um, okay. so David, but it does point out a systematic underestimation. So in a way, given your expertise and scholarly work on this, begs the question of how could they have continually underestimate inflation? And, 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 and I said, this paper says nothing about that. <laughs> this paper just says, I'm gonna take what they estimate and literally estimate from the median projection from the SEP, right? That, that is, and I'm gonna take that and say, if they had followed a policy rule, what would they have done? Okay, but let me, um, let, let me try to move a little faster. So, okay. So um, again, one point here is this the crucial difference between the policy rule and FOMC forward guidance. If you look at the FOMC that say you don't go above the effective load bound until your goals are attained. So, so, so basically it would say, oh, I'm sorry. So, 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 so let me start with the, with, with the Taylor, with, with the, the policy rule. Let's take the Taylor rule as an example. Take the Taylor rule and say, what happens when your goals are attained? Inflation's at your longer run, unemployment's at, at the, or inflation's your longer run, your target, your, what do you have? You have 0.5 for the neutral real interest rate, two for the um, inflation target, and so you get neutral nominal rate of 2.5. So if you attain your goals, you should be at 2.5. What about FOMC forward guidance? said you don't lift off from the effective lower bound until you attain those goals. So you're basically, essentially, FOMC forward guidance, the September forward guidance, that it's, you know, it's essentially designed to not to be behind the curve. It, 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 it curve with any, with any of these policy rules. Now, with inertial rules, you're going to be a lot less behind the curve than with non-inertial rules, and we'll get to that. So this is just a statement with the inertial rule. That's sort of the, the idea of, of, of part of the issue here. So um, if we um, what do with the pa paper now is we're going to take each of the summary of economic projections from September 2022, um, March of 2022, see what the FOMC forward guidance tells you, see what the policy rules, do, see how this evolved, and then we're gonna look for, for, forward. So go with this one in more detail because it shows some things that, 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 that go with all of them. First of all, um, in September 2020, the um, last projection was December 2023, and still at the effective lower bound there. So there's no indication of, of, of when liftoff would, would be. From the policy rules here, so we have non-inertial, we have inertial, we have, we have, we have Taylor balanced approach, we have original consistent short, shortfalls. In this case, original and shortfalls are the same because unemployment, projected unemployment is never under 4%, but that will change. So what do you see here? Well, if we start in the upper left corner with the Taylor inertial rules, the, um, the, the Taylor rule projection, Taylor non-inertial rules is fourth quarter of 2021. The consistent rule is a little, is a little higher, 2022 quarter one. If you move left to right, you go from Taylor to balanced approach, and the dates get a little um, lo lo longer. The, 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 the dates go back, go, go, go out a little bit. Now go to the top or left, upper left, and move down. Now you go to the inertial rules. The dates also get pushed back a, a little bit. And then, of course, you go in both directions. You go to the bottom right, and you have and you have the balanced approach, inertial rules, and the original and shortfalls rules has 2022 fourth quarter, and the consistent rule has 2023 second se second quarter. So, so essentially, of you know, the the, the pattern goes originals or original rules 
an original Taylor rules are the fastest for, um, prescription and then and then going towards balanced approach, it gets pushed back. Going towards inertial goes, gets pushed back. And then you put the two together, gets pushed back. Can I, uh, just to clarify. So what you do here is you take the projections 2020, you take their output and unemployment, I'm sorry, their output and inflation projections, and then you uh, unemployment calculate- Unemployment and inflation. Yeah, sorry, the unemployment and inflation projections and from those, you calculate what the rule says the interest rate projection ought to be. Is that yes. what we're plotting here? Okay. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Ex exactly. Um, ignoring, but you're ignoring the actual interest rate projection. So, for example, your 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 um, your inertial rules bootstrap on the projection. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah yes. Because if you're going to follow this, you wouldn't. You 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 you'd be you'd be doing that's what you would be doing. You wouldn't care of what the project. Yes, exactly. There, another, something I hate to add to the graphs, but one could add to the graph what the interest rate projection was from the 2020 projections, and say, "Wow, hmm, that's awfully different from what the rules say." What, wait, given that's the, others. the black line. John. Ah, that is the, okay. I thought the black zero. line was just the zero that's line zero for the point, graphs. Sorry, that's zero point one. <laughs> sorry, that's zero. Oh, yes, yes, it's that's zero point five. one two five. That's it's not. not <laughs> that's not the winter. <laughs> it's not the x-axis. Okay, sorry, that's got the it. projection. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's the projection exactly. And sorry, in in September twenty twenty, their projection for September for December twenty twenty three. Was four percent unemployment and and about three, I think it was four percent unemployment and, and like th um but but like two percent in, in infl inflation. So they so, so they were they they weren't really close to for lift off. You're not going to get lift off in the projected if if they had gone a year further, you weren't going to get it in the next quarter. Or or two, okay, now. December 2020 is very similar to September 2020. Again, same idea. One thing that you start to see is the um, the prescriptions pushed pushed up. But they be, they start becoming earlier. They're going to become earlier and earlier as we go along. Again, no no change in the FOMC um, prescriptions pr pr prescriptions. And um, but even here. The non-inertial Taylor rule, you, you start have like a fifty basis point in increase. So the, the non-inertial start. March of 2021, um, you now see where the um, inertial uh, inertial ones. Well, first of all, FOMC FOMC predictions still have zero to the end of 2023, but that the inertial rules, especially the inertial non-inertial Taylor rule is sort of getting a big, big jump in the projected um, no, 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 numbers. The, the um, numbers, the others, again, are pretty similar, inertial or non-inertial. June of 2020 is where you really start to see this. So by June of 2020, the Taylor rules all prescribe a, a rate increase. The inertial rule prescribes a 200% rate increase in one quarter. And you have basically these rules either have 200% rate increases in one quarter or have or, or have over 100% increases in two consecutive quarters. These are not inertial rules. The, um, the, the, the Taylor rules also have with the inertial a small rate in, increase and then um, and, and 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 then um, we, and, and and then have um, with the with the um, balanced approach ones. The most of the three of the four aren't prescribing the increase yet. Yeah, qu question. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, so, in considering the previous graphs when depicting the inertial rules. Um, are you calculating the inertial? It looks like you're calculating the inertial action relative to the prescription in the previous quarter, which in many cases, which in most cases is negative. Did you did you contemplate doing sort of a constrained 
inertial rule where you'd really be saying, well, it's zero. We, 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 oh, I'm sorry, we, 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 we don't, we don't, um, we don't kick that in until, until the rate goes up. Yep. Yeah, so, so, so the, 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 the R is, 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 is going to be the zero there. So the rules are the same. Minus, the R minus one zero. will be zero. So if you were to go back, the, the rules gave the same prescription, whether that. they're inertial or non-inertial. Yeah, yeah. So, so you see, but that's why we're not getting negative. We're, 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 not, we're not getting negative numbers there. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're, 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 if you were to go we're back. Doing, doing the lagged R as 0 0.125 until it goes up. Okay, thank you. They were remarkably negative for that to be the case, given a coefficient of 0.85. If you were if you were using the lagged coefficient, the lagged variable was zero. It's remarkable that the prescription, the inertial prescriptions, were as negative as they were. But if that's these, only these, these the inertial prescriptions aren't negative. No, go back, please, a little more. Yeah. So I'm. I guess I, I'm. I'm so, looking at so, the lower. Panels. Okay. So September. The lower panels seem to show very negative inertial rule prescriptions. I, I did check that. I think we. Let me say, I'm, I'm not a hard, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I'm, I'm going to have okay. to. Okay, thank you. At, at that, that's that, yeah, at, at that, I should know that. I'm not sure. So here, June, and again, you you see this now by September 20, 2021, Then, the, the, the sort of you, you that what what do you have here? You have this big big jump with the non inertial rules. You also start seeing. A, differences between the original rules and the shortfall rules because the because unemployment or projected unemployment is going under four percent so you're getting um you're getting a negative part with the original but not with the the short the short the shortfall and then um with with the inertial rules you're um it's a, it's a much smoother path and then of course um because as you know the um FOMC and I guess it was June started had had the first projected rate increase. September they pushed the rate increases back. Careful September also it goes to 2024. So so that's the first time it went out to 20, 2024. Just as a suggestion, it would be good to show the actual projections to get a sense of what news is. You know, is this mostly a response to inflation? Or is this a response to the real economy bouncing back so much faster than they had thought? On the the projections, um, I, I, th I think I think here the the the, the biggest well the biggest changes here may I, I'm not actually really sure of yeah of, of yeah I, I slide I, with I, and I, here's I, how the projections were in September. Well, now what did they do? That that would just how did this this disentangle this. We did a little tiny bit of that in the paper, but think about how to, how to do more. And, and it may have changed over time too. So I mean, that, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point. So you have December, again, again, one thing you're starting to see in December is that when you're projecting out, the non-inertial rule, rule projections start to go down. To get to 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 go closer to the um to, to the the FOMC projections, and we'll come back to that later. Let's look at the the last the, the, the last one, and then look forward. So I I think about five seven minutes or something like that. Okay, so let's look at March, which of course is the last one we have. Although in a week I could, we could rewrite the paper again to go to June, um, and so um. Couple of things that you see here. First, again, you're way behind with the non-inertial, but just not even worry, worry thinking about that. But you're behind with the um, inertial rules, and depending on it, depend in say March of 2022 when the um, when the um, Fed, FOMC raised above the effective. Um, Low, 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 lower bound, then what you have is you're about about one to one and a quarter um, percent behind, 100 to 125 basis points. And of course, you're 500 behind with inertia pools. Okay, so um, let's look at what this says about 
how we want to think about policy rule prescriptions for 2022 to 2024. Okay, what about that? So when we thought about policy rules initially, they're initially here, meaning um, September 2020 through say mid 2021, um, focused on the, in some sense on the consistent rule that was closest to the September, the September um, August 2020 revised statement. Well, now let's look at it the perspective now. First of all, flexible inflation targeting has become utterly irrelevant, right? We've blasted through the 2.2 or 2.4, or whatever you want to call it, whatever number you want to call that. So that part of it, um, th th that part of it no longer matters. Um, matters. Um, but you, but, but so um, you, you can't, um, you, you can't just return to tailor and balanced approach rules again from the perspective of the Fed because they are concerned that they that they they still are doing the sh the shortfall and talking about the the the, sh the shortfalls and in particular they're not raising um, they're, they're not um, raising interest rates when unemployment if unemployment goes under. Um, for, sorry, they're not lowering interest rates under, I'm getting it wrong. Raising interest rates, unemployment goes under um, 4%. They still care about the shortfalls. In particular, what they've done is reiterated fairly often that they're not abandoning the revised statement, but the part that sort of, uh, that, that, that affects here, that, that matters now is the shortfall. But they're also, you also can't use consistent rules. There's no sense where the Fed is going to, is, FOMC is trying to keep unemployment at the current 3.6%. In fact, Jay Powell, maybe a week, week and a half ago, something in a Wall Street Journal panel basically said, we're not going to worry about a few upticks in the unemployment rate. rate. So they're not going to constrain rate increases to keep unemployment under 4%. So that part is, is gone right now. So what do you have left? You have the shortfall um, rules. They're still looking at the shortfalls rather than the deviations. And right now, there's no difference between Taylor and balanced approach shortfalls rules. Why? Because forecasted on actual and forecasted unemployment then with the SCP never goes under 4%, which is where the difference would be. So there's basically now, if you want to think about what I would think about a Fed policy rule now, it would be the shortfall rule. Taylor balanced approach doesn't, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what coefficient you multiply something that's zero with. So, and this is also the median among the six rules. So let's look here at, um, at where we are now and how to get back with the shortfall, with the, with the shortfall rules, maybe two the short for, for rules. So if we, again, I, I, we have, the, again, as starting as where we are now, again, non-inertial, is you know way way higher than anything we do. If we look at the um, inertial rule again from March of 2022. The difference was 125 basis points. The the, the prescription was 1.625. What they did is raised it to, to 0.375. I'm taking I'm taking median of the range, but it, midpoint of the range. For, for, for these. So 0 0.375 is 0 0.25 to 0 0.5. Okay, so now what happens um, going, going forward? Well, the inertial rules keep on going up in, in their um, prescriptions, gonna keep on going, going up again, using the data from the March 2022 SCP till in, 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 20, in, in 2023 and even in the 20. 24. So what is FOMC here? FOMC 
is saying, what would the FOMC have to do to try to get back on track according to the inertial shortfall rule by the end of 2020, the end of 2022? And the answer is one thing they've already done, which is do a 50 basis point increase in May, do something that they're almost certainly going to do, do another 50 basis point increase in June. That's how you get to 1.375. Do another that they've said they're going to do in July, not do a September pause, do another 50% basis point increase in and get up to 2.3. 75 and then you have two more meetings in 2020 to do 150 basis point increase and 125 basis point increase if you look at the cme fed watch tool it totally accords with this through september and then projects 225 basis point projects that increases not a 50 and a 25 so it's not that different D -d -d different that that um, path. Then, what happens? Um, what 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 happens then? Well, if you start looking here, and if you whoops, let me not do that. You start looking there till if till say third quarter of twenty twenty three. So basically, from the end of twenty twenty two. Um, through the third quarter of 2023, just saying FOMC does whatever it needs to do to get stay with the um, with 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 the, um, the 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 shortfall rule pres prescriptions. Then, but third quarter of 20. But what you're seeing here is the inertial rules are going up and then not changing. The non-inertial rules are falling. And so in third quarter of 2023, non-inertial is still higher than inertial. By fourth quarter of 2023, it, it non-inertial goes down lower than, 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 than inertial. And so, basically, so, so again, point, it's, let, it me, let me just finish the thought. Okay. So basically at, at, at that point, then um, you don't want to keep your, what you want to be is non-inertial. You did inertial because you didn't want rate increases to be too high. You don't want to then keep to non-inertial and then make a, to keep the, the rate the rate decreases rates from falling, especially when at this point you don't have to go down more than 25 basis point in any in, in any meeting. So the idea here is you're saying what happens if the FOMC switches back switches back to non-inertial now that inertial's outlived its usefulness. And then starting in December, 2023, go back with the non-inertial. Again, they're not big drops, right? David, David I, I don't think you're allowed to do this because you're taking the inflation path as the projection. And then you're calculating what, will the, what the various policy rules recommend. But that doesn't mean that if the Fed follows one of the other policy rules, they will get the inflation path that they think. So you, you can't just say, oh, well, the, the non-inertial rule get, uh, has a lower interest rate. Let's choose that one. Well, it's not clear that that is going to produce the same inflation. You can't get from here to what the Fed... If the projected, most most again, of what's going again, on again, here... I'm not, what we are not doing here is saying anything about how different policies are going to affect the outcomes. Right, but okay. so, so you can't say the Fed should change from one to the other of these rules. You can uh, say- We're, we're, saying, we're, we're saying that if, that, that if these, if, if, if these, if, if their projections hold, right? I mean, one thing you say is that maybe these projections are conditional on on a specific on a on a on a path, right? And we don't you, you, we don't know the the answer to that. We're saying that 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 how, how would what what if the Fed won? What would yeah, but, be, let me put it this way? Most of what's going on here is that the Fed projects a lot of the inflation is going to go away on its own, and so the 
uh, the non-inertial rules say, great, inflation went away on its own. We can start lowering interest rates. The inertial rules lower the interest rates slower, but, but you can't jump to what the Fed should do and hold the, in, the inflation rate constant. I, I, you, you can certainly use the rules to benchmark is how fast is the Fed reacting relative to what the rule says. But these are holding inflation constant, as you just said. So, so if they change from one to the other rule, surely inflation will change. And in interpreting what's happening, most of what's happening in, the, in these reductions in interest rates is because inflation goes away on its own in the Fed's forecasts. And, and, and then, uh, so won't. David, I want to interrupt. You have to conclude pretty fast as some people will have questions. So maybe try to, if you could wrap up and say a couple of things we've asked. Okay, so this 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 show this graphs what we showed before before. Okay, so um, with the non with, with the two types of um, non non inertial and the inertial rule again, doing the FOMC um, that way. Um, I have to think about John what you said. Maybe maybe better to do. Just, just to, to do this with the, um, I mean, if we look at the March one, th this this is basically the March forecast, and the different things do. Maybe maybe that's a better way to, to think about that. And so, um, last slide. How to let's go back to December twenty twenty two. Now, how to get back to the FOMC path? The liftoff in March twenty twenty two. We need. 550 basis point increase and another 25, 125 basis point increase to get there with the balanced approach. A balanced approach is a little different than the Taylor. Let's not get into that. Lift off in September 2021 could have had 10, 25 basis point increases and 150 basis point increase in December 2021. Got to the same place, but on a much smoother path avoided almost all of the 50 basis point increases, the pivoting, and the churning, and all of that. And we talked about conclusions. OK, conclusions aren't any different than we've th talked about. So I think I stop sharing here. OK. OK. Um, is John Taylor the uh, moderator? Yes, go ahead. Uh, OK. I think. The Fed is hopelessly far behind at this point. Let me suggest uh, you make a simple chart for yourself. Just uh, go to Fred, St. Louis Fed uh, web website chart, and look at the 12 month CPI, 12% change back to 1950. And then put on the same chart the federal funds rate. And you'll see that the Federal Reserve is farther behind even than it ever was in the 1970s. Fed is way behind. I think that what we're gonna end up doing is calling this episode, Great Inflation Number Two. Now, I believe that the Federal Reserve's policy framework is badly broken. It's flawed from the get-go. In Bernanke's new book, there's an interesting passage where he has a discussion about forward guidance with Charlie Plosser. And Plosser was arguing that policy ought to be state dependent. It ought to feed back off of the observations that we see. Bernanke argued against that. He said, we need to have a time dependent view of policy that we convey to the market. That's the forward guidance because we got to talk interest rates down. That was his argument. But we know, I think we know that that approach to policy is, is simply wrong. And it's been wrong from the get go. Now, let me talk just a minute about some work that I did back at the St. Louis Fed, because I think it displays what the issue here is. 
Bob Rash and I worked on the predictive value of the Fed funds market, predicting FOMC policy changes. And after 1994, when the Fed first started to disclose its policy quickly at the conclusion of a meeting, after 1994, the Fed funds market predicted the FOMC decision very accurately the day before. So then Bob and I went to the data and we said, how, how good is this prediction six months in advance? And we used Euro dollar futures because the six month forward uh, future, uh, futures contract was not very active. And the answer was that six months in advance, you got an R square of about 0.3. It was not very accurate at all. And the reason is that stuff happens. There are things that are unpredictable, unforecastable, that between the time of any meeting and the next meeting for that matter. And there are plenty of examples like that. Indeed, that's the problem that the Fed has been facing with COVID. So the effects of COVID, in fact, the very appearance of COVID was not forecast, nor was the appearance of the attack on 911, nor were all sorts of things that happened. So for the Fed to have a policy that is substantially locked in in advance is a big mistake. And the problem is that with the forward guidance, the Fed feels committed to following through on its forward guidance and actually setting the Fed funds rate as it had said it was going to. But that means that the policy is not reactive or very reactive to the incoming flow of information. So that policy framework, I thought we had abandoned decades ago, but that's the policy framework that the Fed is now using and that Powell has inherited. And the idea behind it is to make Fed policy predictive to the bond market. That's the main reason the Fed is doing it. But by letting inflation run, the economy is unpredictable to everybody else. And there's gonna be a long time to unwind all this. Given what's happened already with the inflation rate, all sorts of relative prices are out of whack. If you look at the employment cost index and look at the employment uh, costs, the wage increases for union and non-union workers, for example, you see that union workers are lagging behind. And of course, that's not surprising because most union contracts are one-year contracts. Non-year, non-union compensation is much more responsive to the state of the labor market. So there are all sorts of relative prices that are now out of whack. If you want a, a very good picture of the importance of low interest rates, take a look at the Case-Shiller price index for houses. So houses have been, house prices have been booming at about a 20% annual rate varies across the country. I think the latest reading showed 30% annual rate in Tampa and Phoenix. Now that's way out of whack, that, that cannot continue. So there's so many relative prices now that are disconnected with each other away from normal circumstances that the inflation will not unwind easily. I believe that the Fed's estimates, forecasts of inflation are simply unrealistic. So Bill, Bill, that, that, Bill, Bill we, I, finish up, okay? Sorry, Bill, finish up. Okay, an analogy I like to use is a, 
a bunch of cars, trucks stop behind a red light. Now, if you had a conductor as you do with an orchestra, they could all move ahead right away. But the economy doesn't work that way. So you can't move ahead until the car ahead of you moves ahead. There are all sorts of buffers like that that are in the economy that are built into normal behavior. And the Fed's inflation forecast is just unrealistic. Thanks, Bill. David, and then we'll hear from uh, Larry Meyer and Jeff Lacker. David, a quick reaction. Okay. Is, is that um, one thing, is that one diff, a central difference in my mind between policy rule forward guidance and the FOMC forward guidance is what the FOMC has done is a path as this is to what to expect. It's un, it, it's pretty much basically un, unconditional and things can change. The policy rule forward guidance is explicitly conditional. And so the projections depend on the current projections projections and then um, and then can change and for example will change next Wednesday. I, I understand that. What happened in August of 2020 was that the FOMC gutted, literally gutted the inflation target. So instead of some Odyssean discipline, the Fed walked away from its own target. And it's vague, it's vague. It, nobody can understand what it really means. The Fed doesn't know what it really means. It doesn't <laughs> set any guidance whatsoever to the FOMC as to what it ought to do. So the Fed gutted its own inflation target back at that time. Okay, Larry, Larry Meyer and then Jeff Lacker. Larry, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. David, a very interesting paper. Uh, what I liked about it was that you used a short run uh, inflation objective uh, to capture overshooting after undershooting. Also, that as I have said, overshooting, it's not an inflation, average inflation targeting regime. It's overshooting just a little after undershooting. And second, you have a nice way of treating the asymmetry in the unemployment rate. Having said that, none of that is relevant to your results. Uh, it doesn't appear in Clarida's rule. So first of all, uh, we don't have to talk about this uh, short run inflation objective because inflation has been above 2% for some time. So forget it. The Fed is trying to get back to 2% period. So leave the long run 2% as your, as your inflation objective. With respect to the asymmetry, with respect to the unemployment rate, it's not relevant. The unemployment rate is below the Nairu. Uh, and that's why Clarida just zeroes that out. Okay, so we don't have to worry about those two things. Now, where I disagree with you is your treatment of maximum employment. I understand it. There's so much confusion about this inside as well as outside the committee. I have said from the beginning that maximum employment, it's, it's been with us for 50 years in the Federal Reserve Act. It was always interpreted as maximum sustainable unemployment rate. You recognize that that's the same as the minimum sustainable unemployment rate, the Naira. It's always been the Naira. And that's what Clarida always said. And I always said to him, but the committee is so confused. He said, Larry, don't worry, we'll get it right. And they did. In the end, they lifted off when the unemployment rate got to 4%, which they said was maximum employment. So, uh, I, I think those are the, the really important. Thing. I, I do want to say that John made a very important comment. It's a critique of what I have been doing uh, as well. It's true, you cannot really do this without embedding it in a macro model. Because anytime you change the rule and, the, and what the Fed is going to do, you're going to change what happens to inflation. Okay, but that requires you embedding this in something like a, a small macro model. Okay, I don't do it either, but John's made a good point there. Okay, uh, Jeff Lacker, Jeff. Yeah, thank you. First, uh, really interesting paper, David. Uh, really enjoyed listening to you present. Um, the I think it, there's a I'm making an observation about the natural rate of uh, unemployment that I think is relevant to the policy rule literature and relevant to this recent episode, and, and I'm not sure I can understand all the implications, but I think it's something we 
that would be useful to think about. The way the summary of economic projections is constructed, uh, participants are asked for what the unemployment rate, GDP growth, the whole everything is going to be in the longer run after the effect of current shocks have died out and in the absence of any further shocks. Now, um, everything we know about the determination of um, a benchmark uh, level of employment that's relevant to uh, current inflation processes is that, you know, call it maximum employment, call it, you know, U star or N star, whatever, is that it responds to almost every shock that we've got. And so in the second quarter of 2021, we were pretty close to maximum employment. And so what employment would be in the long run after all the dust has settled, after all the shocks have died out, it's kind of irrelevant in the second quarter of 2021. And I think, I think that's part of the reason the Fed was led astray and um, it was drawn to the interpretation that inflation is transitory. Um, I, last year in the fall, Chairman Powell notably, or maybe it was in the winter, admitted that we were at maximum, that most of the committee thought we were at maximum employment. Um, so given that, I, you know, and, and given that, you know, they're essentially saying, yeah, a return of the labor force participation rate to its longer run trend is kind of irrelevant to inflation now. You know, it's not clear that, that the natural rate um, is that, that that effect is picked up in the way that um, the U star term is typically constructed in, in uh, these policy rule analyses. So it, it's something I think is, is germane to this, that, that um, you know, you're stuck with the supply you got and it's always demand relative to supply. And, um, but I'm, I'm not sure I can see exactly how that, that effect might affect your analysis, David. But it's, it's something I think that's important in the current episode. So let's hear from uh, Mike Boskin and David, you can react to these points. Yeah, David, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I think I learned something which is not true of every presentation I listen to, so thanks a lot. Uh, I'm kind of in a sense uh, making a comment that's a cousin of what Jeff and Larry have been saying. And that is, I think not enough emphasis has been placed on what I would call the seduction of the social benefits of low unemployment, uh, causing a very, very big change and an asymmetric risk analysis by the Fed and many others. You know, we had this first time in a very long time in decades where inequality declined, wages grew more fast, rapidly at the bottom. Uh, you know, in 2017, 18, 19, poverty rates were really low for minorities. All those are great things. So I think there was actually something of a, some, that was kind of seductive. And uh, well, why don't we just keep running this and let's get back there and let's try to make sure that we get all those benefits and we worry about inflation later, we have the tools to deal with it, we'll, we'll know it's coming, et cetera. So I think, and then when, when the Fed, um, uh, including the chairman, were, were vocally supportive of a lot of fiscal stimulus, uh, I think it made it difficult for them to uh, comment on the risk from the greatly added fiscal stimulus in 2021. Uh, so I think those, while they're not easy to model, I think that I think actually in the decision making of a lot of people, those were important elements. David, you want to react to that and also to Larry and Jeff? Sure. Okay. So I think um, first, in terms of of models, I think obviously there are things that you can analyze with models that you can't analyze without um, models. Also, I think things. And, and so this paper is not, not saying you shouldn't go there, saying this paper does, does not go there, um, go there, because there are things you can analyze with, without um, mo models. Um, not, not saying that, that we shouldn't go there or I won't want to go there in my next paper. <laughs> it's just not, not, not this paper. There are also things that you can look at and think of in terms of the what the Fed does and what the Fed doesn't. There's, you know, the, the Fed has looked at 
PCE inflation, really core PCE inflation now for a long time. And that, yes, it's different from this, this, the CPI. The discipline in this paper is to just stay at what the Fed is looking at, at and what they are talking about, about, about. You go off in all sorts of different directions other than that. On the clarative rule, which I talk about in the paper, I didn't, didn't get a chance to mention today, the clarative rule was basically the um, shortfall um, rule starting after liftoff. So the difference between what Rich wrote in, I think, November 2020 with rule and what we with our shortfall rules is that is that is that his rule starts um, will start start after liftoff and is actually very 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 consistent with March 2022 FOMC forward guidance. Uh, not exactly. You, you, again, like, again, one thing he did not do is we have a particular number. He did not specify a particular number. The reason for that is you can't you can't actually if you specify a particular number, you can't be exactly right because you're going to be too too fast in the beginning when you're far away and then too slow at the end. With the but, but we are at, we so, are after yes. what we are after lift we are after lift off. Okay, that's why that's why clarity is rules what it is. But, but, his rule only applies but, after but, but what, what I'm saying is that after his rule in, in November 2020 is really in accord with the FOMC um, projections start in March of 2022. And, and, and to, you know, good, a, a year and a half earlier. He has a paper in January 2022 where he sets out the rule. And it's just as I said it was. No, no, he, he set out the rule in November 2020 in his Brookings speech. His rule predated liftoff by a good long time. And, and, and then he, But his rule was about what happens after liftoff. That's right. That's what and, it was and, then, and, and exactly what I said is that the difference between his rule and our shortfall rule is the same algebraic formulation, except his rule starts lift off our rule goes the whole time which is why you get different, different exactly. um th things um in 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 terms of the the maximum inflation i believe it was no starting in november 2021 then the statements you started you you first heard language like we've achieved our inflation goals but not our unemployment goals. Exactly. December 2021, tw it's we we'll still have that, but now we're closer. January 22 is like, well, we're going to achieve them by the next, essentially the next um, meeting. One, one thing that I, I, that's, that, that I think is important is that in August of 2020, the expectation was that it was going to take longer to get inflation up to two percent than to get unemployment down to four percent, and it was basically just taking the, the idea of the experience after the um, after the financial um, crisis, and that flipped. But that's you know that, that's not re that's not relevant. That's not the, the, fault. Is, the, 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 the Fed's fault. The Fed's using acted. the information. They yeah. okay, but the committee acted as if it believed that 4% was maximum employment and 4% is the naira. That's what they did. They waited until it got to 4%. They said, oh yeah, inflation is high. We can't do anything because we have to get to maximum employment, which I said is the naira, which was estimated at 4% and exactly what they did in practice. Okay, that's my point. But, but I, 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 would, I would argue that they did not, they did not view that they were going to wait till unemployment got the four percent. They were going to wait till unemployment got under four percent, and to see what happened with 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 inflation. They were trying to drive unemployment below your naira. No. So no, they weren't trying to do that. I think you misjudged what what uh, Powell said. He said, you know, we'd like to get back to three and a half because at three and a half we had no signs of inflation. And Powell always said, you don't estimate the Nairu, you experience it. So he said, we experienced three and a half, 
and there was no inflation, so three and a half must be the Nairu. It well could be, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, but that's what he was saying, okay? The estimate of the Nairu by the committee was four. That's when they, that's when they lifted off. Didn't it go beyond the Nairu to equitable employment? It wasn't just oh, about yeah, the overall yeah. level, right? No, no. So there's a lot of confusion but, but in the, about the, the, August the, the 2020 narrative. The, 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 the August the 2020 FOMC revised right. statement, they were very specific about they were not going to put out unemployment in the long run on each of their statements, although it will stay in the SEP. And Powell's statements like, you know, 4% 4, 4 would be nice, but we're not going to stop there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hence my seduction. No, I think that was just, yeah. The FOMC, the, the FOMC paid no attention to the risks. They paid no attention to the risks that their outlook might not be correct. So not, David, not, I, I think we have to stop, but Jeff and Larry and Bill should go back to the Fed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too old. <laughs> anyway, I try to give him advice. What can I say? This is wonderful. You got us thinking and doing and saying. And we'll have you back again, David. Thank you so much. It's true. It's been terrific. Thank you. Thank you.